Suddenly, the door opened. From the light, Mickey could see that it wouldn't be hard at all. Reno came out with only the girl. As he approached the car, the three men stepped out. The guns in their hands gave warning. The girl screamed, and Reno wished for the last time that he had his hands on a gun. It was over that quick. All three men fired. The girl dropped before Reno did. But when they fell, Johnny B made sure they were dead. He walked over to both bodies and shot them in the head. Hello and welcome to Ralph Reed's, brought to you by T-U-R-N, the United Ronin Networks here on YouTube. My name is R4, and I would like to start things off by introducing you to Donald Goins, El Dorado Red. Let's get right to it. This will be a multi-part series. Fasten your seatbelts and let the reading commence. Chapter 1 Shirley Booth handled the small compact car as if it was a toy. She drove like a man. Every now and then she glanced at the younger woman sitting next to her. Dolores! Do you think you'll ever learn this numbers route? It's so damn spread out, you know? That's the problem. Sometimes I wonder if it's even worth it, running all over the damn place picking up each customer's play. I've just about got it down pat now, Shirley, Dolores answered quickly. It's just the small stops like the one we're going to now that gets me mixed up. Too many damn small stops, if you ask me, Dolores stated sharply as she glanced over at the older woman. As the women became silent, Dolores wondered idly why Shirley had never become bigger in El Dorado's numbers outfit. She had been with El Dorado Red ever since he'd first started out back in the 50s. From what she heard people say, Shirley used to be a fine bitch in her prime before she allowed herself to become so heavy, and yet Shirley still had a shape. She wasn't what you call real fat, but she was big. She wore expensive clothes that made her look better than what another woman her size would look like in cheaper clothes. Shirley turned on the freeway and drove over to the west side. She came up on Grand Boulevard and made a right turn at Ford's Hospital. At the first side street, she made another right. She parked in front of a dilapidated house that sat back from the street. It was a small house that had once been painted white, but now from neglect, the paint was peeling and it looked as if no one had lived in it for years. As the two women walked up the long pathway leading to the front door, they both noticed someone watching them from one of the front windows. God damn it, Shirley exclaimed loudly. This damn place really gives me the creeps. Every time I have to pick up here, I hate it. I'll be damn glad to give this route to you. Dolores gestured at the long weeds that had taken the place of the grass. Well, it doesn't look like a jungle out here, but I would think a lawnmower would take care of that little problem. Honey, Shirley began, it's not the grass that I'm talking about. Wait till you get inside the house. It will make the outside look like heaven. Plus the fact that you have to put up with both of those old bitches inside? Shit, a nut house would be a better resting place for them than here. Before she could knock on the front door, it opened. As they started to go inside, Dolores stated quietly, You're too cold, Shirley. One day we'll... The sight of the old woman standing behind the door stopped Dolores' flow of words. Dolores stared at the old woman in surprise. She looked as if she wasn't a day under 100. Her skin was wrinkled like nothing she'd ever seen before. But the real shock was the eye staring out of the black face at her. There was a gleam in them that spoke of madness. Lordy, 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 the woman shouted at them like a parrot. Come on in, come on in. She held the door only halfway open so that the women had to squeeze past her. As Shirley entered, she wondered for the thousandth time why El Dorado Red continued to carry the women. It was true that when the two sisters' brother was alive, it had been a good stop. But he had died over five years ago, and since then, the place had fallen off until it really wasn't worth the trouble for the fear worker to stop there. It was just too small. 
Sometimes the sisters didn't have $50 for their day's take, but she knew if she had brought the matter up to Red, he'd just say every little bit counts. This was the first time Shirley had brought Dolores to the stop. She had glanced out of the corner of her eye to see how the slim, brown-skinned young woman was taking it. It was really a change from the other homes they went to. There was a look of total surprise and fright on Dolores' face at the sight of the horde of roaches running wild on the walls of the front room. Where the hell is Auntie Dee? Shirley asked sharply. She didn't want to stay in the house for any length of time if it could be avoided. The roaches didn't frighten Shirley, but she didn't like the thought of one of them falling on her. It made her flesh crawl. Auntie D is the one who picks up the numbers in the neighborhood, Shirley explained to Dolores. She takes care of all the work. This poor thing here ain't too much help. She didn't understand too much other than the Bible. She'll talk you to death about that, but nothing else. Have a seat. Have a seat. The old woman yelled in a shrill voice, waving the women towards a dilapidated couch that was covered by a sheet and a blanket. Before Shirley could warn her, Dolores stated to sit down. A mouse ran from under the couch. Dolores screamed and jumped on top of the couch. There was no way Shirley could stop the flow of laughter that was taking control of her. She bent over and laughed until tears rolled down her face. Dolores never took her eyes off the mouse. She watched the rodent go under the huge old-fashioned china cabinet that stood against the wall. Little Jesus! Little Jesus! The old woman scolded as she banged on the china cabinet. You bad thing, you! Scaring the woman like that! Now, now, Auntie, Shirley interrupted. That ain't necessary you taking on like that. It was my fault for not telling Dolores that you kept a few pet mice and rats around. At the mention of the rats, Dolores' eyebrows shot up. And she glanced around nervously. She started to say something, but the sound of a harsh voice coming from behind a curtain leading into the kitchen stopped her. Y'all have to keep that fuss down out there if you expect me to ever finish writing up these here figures. Is that you, Auntie D? Shirley asked, knowing all along it was the woman she was looking for. Of course it's me, child. Who'd you expect it to be? Maybe Miss World or somebody like that? The woman behind the curtain yelled sharply. Before Shirley could stop her, Dolores was up and heading for the kitchen. Possibly because of her fear of rats, she didn't wait for Shirley to lead the way. Shirley followed the younger woman, even though she had never gone any farther than the front room. Her curiosity was aroused. The elderly woman sitting at the kitchen table looked up in surprise as the two women came barging in. But the person who was really surprised was Dolores as she stopped and stared open-mouthed at the old woman in front of her. She was utterly unlike any woman Dolores had ever seen. The impact of her presence was almost tactile in the silence that greeted their unwelcome entry. The old woman was as black as her sister. Neither woman had that rich nightshade velvety blackness that had its own sable beauty. Instead, the woman sitting in front of them had a gray black shade with a deeply purple tinge about her lips. Her face was a mass of wrinkles that made her seem immensely old, but her eyes were the feature that held them. There was an evil glare in the pinpoint pupils, an undeniable quality of evil that could not be hidden. Well, the old woman asked sharply in that husky voice that seemed to come from the emptiness of a deep well. This was not the first time Shirley had met Auntie Dee. Ever since the death of her brother, Auntie Dee had been handling the numbers route. So Shirley was acquainted with the woman. But for some reason, the sight of Auntie D always gave Shirley a sense of fear. The old woman had never done anything to her, but the feeling was there just the same. Y'all could have waited just as well in the front room for me to finish adding up these hair figures instead of running all over my house this ways, Auntie D stated harshly. Shirley had no doubt that the woman could see she was blushing for something to do. Shirley fumbled around in her purse and found her eyeglasses. Sorry about this, Dolores spoke up loudly. It's my fault we came barging into your kitchen. I heard your voice and just didn't think. We're running late today, so I just wasn't thinking. This going to be my new pickup girl? Auntie Dee asked sharply, writing out numbers on a slip of paper. Yes, I'm the person who'll be stopping to pick up your stuff every day, Dolores replied. Suddenly, she noticed something over the stove on the wall. It looked as if the wall was alive. It moved. She shook her head and squinted at the wall again and again and seemed to move. 
Auntie D finished writing out her figures, folded up the paper, and stuck it in an envelope which held some other slips. It seems as if my route's getting smaller every day, Auntie D offered, as an excuse as she held out the envelope. There ain't but $28 inside, but things gonna pick up. Y'all just gotta have a little patience with me. There was a slight hint of pleading in her voice. The few extra dollars they made off the numbers route probably helped the women pay off many of their bills. Dolores didn't notice the envelope being offered to her. She was too busy trying to see what was on the back wall of the kitchen. Shirley reached over and took the envelope from Auntie D's hand. After glancing at the figures on the outside of the package, Shirley shook her head. I don't know, Auntie D. It's getting awful small. You had better try and pick up some of your old businesses. While we used to pick up as high as $200 a day through the week here. This kind of take, Shirley shook the envelope. This ain't worth the price it cost us to pay Dolores here to come pick it up. Ouch, goddammit, she cursed loudly as Dolores backed up on her foot. Watch what the hell you're doing. Dolores didn't even hear her in the haste to get out of the kitchen. Shirley grabbed her arm and held her tightly. What the hell's the matter with you? What's wrong with you? What the hell's going on with you? What's wrong with you? For a minute, Dolores couldn't speak. She only pointed. On the wall. Over the stove. Is it what I think it is? She finally managed to say. As Shirley adjusted her glasses on her nose, Auntie D spoke up. Shit! She exclaimed loudly, where's that child been living? She ain't never seen a few roaches before? By now, Shirley could make out the black mass of caked up roaches. There were so many of them that it seemed as if the wall was alive. They seemed to move in unison. There were so many of them that you could take a piece of cardboard and scrape them off without reaching the wall underneath. Roaches living on top of roaches. The smaller ones on the bottom had been crushed to death by the larger ones on top. It seemed to Shirley that the wall held more roaches than all of the roaches she had ever seen in her life. Putting together every roach-infested house she had ever been in, none of them had ever come close to showing such a display of filth. The fear that Dolores felt only added fuel to Shirley's own terror. Ordinarily, the sight of a few roaches wouldn't have disturbed either woman, but so many at one time was a terrifying sight. My God, Shirley murmured as she backed out of the kitchen with Dolores clutching her arms. And it was a good thing that the women backed out, because over the doorway was another mass of roaches. As they tumbled through the doorway, the footsteps jarred a few of the roaches loose, and they fell down on the women. Oh shit! Oh shit! God damn it! Dolores screamed as she brushed the roaches off her arm. Shirley thought that the creatures had fallen in her hair. She reached up and snatched the expensive wig off her head. She shook it out and she fled from the house. Auntie D followed the women out of the house and stopped on the porch. She stared after the running women in shock. Why, I never, she began, then shook her head. She turned and glanced at her sister, who stood in the doorway holding the envelope that Shirley had dropped. Can you believe grown women could act like that at the sight of a few roaches? I do declare women ain't women no damn more. Then it dawned on her what her sister was holding. She grabbed the envelope out of her sister's hand and rushed down the narrow sidewalk as fast as her skinny legs would allow, waving the envelope. Hold up there, gal. You done run off and left everything, she screamed as she ran up to the car. Shirley sat behind the steering wheel, crying hysterical tears as she held her wig. Neither woman had gotten complete control of themselves yet. My God. Shirley murmured softly. The sight of them things made my flesh crawl. I still feel as if I've got those fucking things all over me. Auntie D banged on the window. Here, child, y'all done run out and left the figures. I don't know what got into you girls acting like that. For a minute, Dolores just stared at the woman peering in at them. She couldn't quite understand what Auntie D was saying. It was more her nerves than anything else that caused laughter to build up inside of her. It was like a relief valve releasing the tension that had been built up inside. Shirley knew she should do something, but for the moment her brain locked on her. She couldn't get her thoughts together. The wild laughing of Dolores didn't help matters either. She started the motor so that she could let the window down and receive the package that Auntie D kept waving so crazily. The sound of the motor starting put Auntie D in a frenzy. Just a minute, Shirley yelled as she let the window down. 
None of the women had noticed the police car that had pulled up beside them. They were all too occupied to pay attention to what was going on outside. Shirley was reaching out for the envelope that contained the numbers when the policeman knocked on the window. As Shirley glanced over her shoulder and saw the policeman knocking, the first thing that crossed her mind was that she was busted. There was no doubt about it. The policeman had heard Auntie D screaming about the numbers inside the envelope. One quick glance at the policeman brought Dolores back to reality. She realized that she had a pocketbook full of numbers. The only thing she didn't realize was that they were already busted. She had no way of knowing that the officers had watched most of the proceedings. What they hadn't witnessed themselves, they could just about fill in from the shouting Auntie D had been doing. There wasn't the slightest doubt in their minds as to what the envelope held. Shirley tried to straighten up. She knew that they were on their way downtown and that there was no reason for her to look like a tramp. She began to put the wig back on. Chapter 2 Charles Williams stood in the bathroom and admired his physique. Not bad, he said as he patted his growing stomach. Charles stood over six foot two barefoot. His physique wasn't anything a young man in his teens or early twenties would have been proud of, but for a man forty years old, it was above average. His stomach was too fat, but other than that, he could justly say he was in good shape. He still possessed all of his teeth, bragging that he had never even had a toothache. He wore his hair cut close in a neat natural that was graying at the edges. Charles stepped on the bathroom scale, and the needle went up to two hundred and ten pounds. Charles grinned as he got down and did ten quick push-ups. Not bad, he said again, not in the least out of breath. For an old man, I say, Eldorado Red, you're in the best of health. Are you talking to me, Red? His latest young girl asked from the bedroom. Eldorado Red took one last look in the full-length mirror before walking out of the bathroom. He pranced around the bed. The young, attractive black girl was stretched out on the lush spread. Tina, he said in that loud voice of his. I'd say you're about one of the luckiest bitches in this cold, old world we live in. Tina tried to frown. You know, I don't like that word, Red. I ain't nobody's bitch, and I don't like to be called one either. Red stopped his prancing and glanced down at her. Hey, baby, how many times do I have to tell you that bitch is a term of endearment? It depends on what tone of the voice the person uses. Now, when I spoke of it a minute ago, I was really only using it as a figure of speech. If you found something depraved about the word, honey, it's in your own little mind. For a minute, Tina just stared up at him. Then she sat up on the edge of the bed. There you go again, Rado Red, using them words. When you start talking like that, you make everything seem right. Charles Williams better known by his friends as El Dorado Red, just smiled a cold, bitter smile. It was the smile of a man who had seen just about everything there is to see. Tina, you are one lucky girl. For one thing, you don't think too much. At least, I don't believe you do anyway. All you're concerned about is a pretty dress and learning the latest dance steps. The irony in his voice was missed by Tina. You gonna let me go shopping today, she asked greedily. Just as quickly as his good mood had come, it vanished. Tina watched the tall, light-skinned man stride over to the dresser and pick up his pants. He slid them on quickly, reached in the pocket, and counted his money. Here, honey, he said as he peeled off a hundred dollars and tossed it on the bed. When you finish shopping, rent you a room in a motel somewhere. That way, you'll be closer to the stores you like so well. It took a second for Tina to realize it, but she had somehow managed to get on the wrong side of him. El Dorado was mad, and she couldn't understand why. Honey, you're not angry with me, are you? She inquired, sweetly. Angry? Why, baby, what could you possibly do to make me lose my cool? He asked, smiling at her. As she paid closer attention, she would have noticed that the smile didn't quite reach his eyes. They remained a misty gray, cold and bleak. Well then, Daddy, ain't no sense me wasting no good money on no old motel room. Besides, I hate to sleep alone. I'll just do my shopping and catch a cab back here. No, I'm afraid you won't do that either. 
El Dorado answered. When you leave, you'll take all the clothes you've been buying the past week with you. Before she can say anything, he went on. I mean it, Tina. I don't like for a bitch to think she's playing on me. I've been kind to you all this week, honey. Giving you money to go shopping, but I don't like for a bitch to try to hustle me. He waved her reply down. Don't say it. It will only make matters worse, Tina. Yes, you did try to hustle me. Even if you don't have the sense to realize it, you did try. Every fucking day this week, I've given you better than $100 each day. As long as you didn't ask for it, it was all right. But today, honey, you let the cat out of the bag. So you take that little money and make the best of it. She ran over to the man and put her arms around his waist. Oh, daddy, I know it must be more than that to it. Did Buddy say something to you? Because if he did, he was lying. I ain't had nothing to do with your son, even though he's been hitting on me ever since I got here. The coldness in his eyes became chilling as he stared down at the woman with her head on his chest. Tina, I haven't even talked to my son, so don't say anything you might regret. If he's been hitting on you, I don't want to know anything about it. El Dorado pushed the woman away from him. The thought that his son would stoop to hit on one of the chippies that he brought home filled him with rage. He had been very good to the boy ever since Buddy had left his mother's home six months ago and moved in with him. He had tried to give Buddy everything a young boy of 18 can want. His own car and clothes that any boy would be proud of. Anything Buddy wanted, all he had to do was ask for it. The very thought of his own son going behind his back after one of the cheap bitches that El Dorado brought home was almost unbearable. He didn't even want to look at the girl in front of him. Of course, she was young enough to be his daughter, but that wasn't the point. He hated betrayal on any level, and the thought of his own son attempting to go behind his back was disgusting. Get out, he ordered harshly. Take your shit and get the fuck out my sight, Tina. I mean it. I want you out of here as soon as goddamn possible. Tina took one look at his face and decided to follow his orders. He might change his mind and decide to take back the clothes he had bought for her. The thought of that happening filled her with more fear than the thought of a beating. She rushed around the room, gathering up her stuff. El Dorado turned away from her and left the bedroom. He walked out into his luxurious living room and sat down. Red reached over and tapped a switch on the couch and music came flowing out of the walls. The sound was everywhere. His glance went around his beautiful $80,000 home. It hadn't always been like this. It had taken hard work to get where he was. That was one reason why the thought of his son's betrayal hurt so much. He had been planning on teaching Buddy everything about his organization there was to know, so that one day he could just turn it all over to his only son. El Dorado Red laughed harshly. It wasn't a very pleasant sound coming from him. It carried the bitterness that he felt so deep down. Nothing had ever been given to him. He'd have been happy if his dad had given him a pair of shoes when he came up, let alone a new sports car and all the damn clothes a kid could want. The years slipped by as he sat there and he remembered the cold days he had spent walking from house to house, picking up each player's number personally, and how he had to turn in all the plays for over a dollar to another. Bigger numbers outfit because his small bankroll couldn't stand a hit for over $500. All the dimes and two-bit plays were his meat at the time, but the day finally came when he could take the chance and hold on to some of the dollar bets. He'd been lucky then because nobody ever hit on him for over 50 cents. What had made his name good was the way he paid off. Whenever someone did hit, whether it was for pennies, dimes, or 50 cents, he'd personally make sure they got their money the first thing in the morning. As soon as he was sure the number wouldn't be changed, he'd be there with their money. His reputation for paying off quickly spread so that soon new customers were asking for him. El Dorado Red's numbers route grew from a small hundred dollar a day route up to where he was picking up five hundred dollars a day. Then he had started hiring girls to work for him. Shirley had been one of the first. 
He had given her his own personal route while he started to build up another one from the new customers coming in. It had been slow, but it had finally paid off. Tina came out of the bedroom carrying her suitcase. El Dorado, honey, I don't see why we should have to end up like this. I mean, we was getting along so fine, then all of a sudden we fall out. I don't really understand yet. What happened? Red just stared at her. Did you call you a cab? When she said that she had, he added, I think it would be best if you went out on the porch and waited on it, Tina. Before she could say anything, they heard a horn blowing. That's probably your cab now, El Dorado said coldly. Tina gathered up her belongings. She started to say something to him, but his face was set in such hard lines that she changed her mind. Red watched her walk out of his home and, he hoped, out of his life. It was getting time to go over to his drop-off house and find out if everybody came in off their routes. He didn't anticipate any problems. He just received personal happiness from being around the receiving house when all the numbers came in. It filled him with pride to see all the money stacked up on the table. Red was a self-educated man, so he took a lot of pride in his accomplishment. To know that he was the creator of his own organization, one that took in from five to ten thousand dollars every day, gave him much pleasure. El Dorado Red knew it wasn't what you would call a big outfit, but it was big enough. Red walked to the window and watched the woman get in the cab. Good. That was one problem off his back. It would be a damn long time before he allowed another bitch to move into his house, he told himself harshly. That was a mistake he could do without. El Dorado went back into the bedroom and finished dressing. Dressed in neat slacks and matching dark blue shirt, he checked the expensive watch on his arm to make sure he had enough time, then locked the front door behind him as he left. The bright red El Dorado Cadillac sat inside the garage. El Dorado had once taken pride in buying a new Cadillac every year, but now the cars were just another form of transportation. That was the way life went, he rationalized. Things that you used to take pleasure in became common, unexciting, and ordinary affairs. Maybe he was getting old. That could be one reason why nothing seemed like it used to be. At one time, he would have never gotten mad at Tina, understanding that it was just a young girl's greed. Any black girl that had never had anything would have been carried away with what he had to offer. A beautiful home, a swimming pool in the backyard, and other things that he took for granted were exciting to a girl like Tina. But people like Buddy were different. Buddy took everything for granted, as if it were his due. Maybe that was the problem. He had never sat Buddy down and explained that no one owed Buddy or his mother anything. Especially that bitch he called the mother. Vera. A tall, brown-skinned woman who was too attractive for her own good. A woman who used her beauty for a tool to bend other people to her will. El Dorado Red backed the long Cadillac out of the driveway. He didn't bother to glance back at the beautiful ranch-type home he was leaving. The well-kept lawn and the beautifully trimmed hedge that spoke of money were things that he had worked a lifetime to achieve. It didn't cross his mind that there was a possibility he might end up losing everything he had worked so hard to gain. But even at that moment, incidents were working that would push him to the wall. People were scheming to overthrow his small organization, and even as he drove slowly toward town, other people were riding. Their one motive was to relieve El Dorado Red of some of that hard cash they knew he had. Chapter 3 The four men riding in the car laughed and talked louder than was necessary. Wine bottles passed from the back to the front with frequency as they neared the destination. God damn, buddy. You sure now? It ain't but five women and two men. A fat, dark-complexioned young man asked for the tenth time. Buddy, a tall, light-complexioned Negro, twisted around in his seat in the front of the car and glanced back at the man. Listen, Tubby, my man, I ain't wasting my time selling this shit up for nothing. When I say it ain't but so many people in one of these joints, I know what I'm talking about. If you're scared shitless, man, just say so. If you want out, it's damn near too late for that. We done went over this shit for a month, getting the right people together and everything, so now it's D-Day. The men fell silent in the car while Tubby wiped the sweat from his brow. He didn't want the rest of the guys to know that he was frightened. El Dorado Red wasn't no punk, no matter what Buddy said. 
Tubby had been around for a long time, and he knew about a few of the things El Dorado Red has done when he was climbing to the top of his field. Nah, man, I ain't scared. It's just that I'm thinking too close to this thing, man. It just seems as if it's too easy. I mean, a guy like your old man just doesn't take chances, buddy. It's too pat. Tubby answered doggedly. Buddy gave him a practice sneer. My old man is a punk, man. He don't know nothing but how to smell under some funky young bitch's dress. That's all he got on his mind, man. Pussy. That's it. Pussy. He repeated harshly as he thought about Tina and how the fine young bitch had turned her back on him. How the bitch could prefer his father to him. But he would never understand. It hurt his pride. Samson, a husky brown-skinned brother, took his eyes off the street for a moment to glance at Buddy. Your old man may be a lot of things, Buddy, but he ain't no punk man, Samson stated loudly. Whenever he spoke, the rest of the men paid attention because Samson was the kind of man you respected. He wasn't tall, but he was built wide, standing about five foot nine with huge shoulders. His muscles seemed to move on their own when he walked. Yeah, man, Buddy replied coldly. I done heard all that shit about how my old man handled the dagos when he tried moving in on his numbers outfit. He didn't try to conceal the contempt in his voice as he continued. To listen to you guys tell it, my old man was one ball of fire. Yes, siree, he's just too goddamn much. The silence that invaded the car was heavy. Each man looked away from his neighbor, as if he didn't want the man next to him to see the uneasiness that was all too apparent. Motherfuck it, Samson stated coldly. If you want to fool yourself, buddy, that's all right with me. But don't think I'm buying that shit. Ain't no fools in this car, man. Each and every one of us know just what we're getting into. Your old man might not do nothing to you about knocking off one of his joints, but he'll bury one of our black asses if he ever gets wind of it. Amen to that, Danny, a slim, jet-black drug addict stated. And ain't no motherfucking doubt about it going any other way than that way, man. When we fuck over El Dorado shit, the dudes are going to be mean for whatever nigga gets his nuts caught in the sand. Me, I ain't worried because I'm pulling up for the Big Apple tonight right after we split up the cash. You've been going to the Big Apple ever since I met you, Danny, Buddy replied harshly. The furthest you're going to get with your money, man, is the nearest dope house. Take this, my man, Danny began. If I don't never get to New York, it ain't nobody's motherfucking concern but mine. Maybe I find my thing in talking about going to the Big Apple. But whether or not I go, it's still my business and not yours, my man. So don't be so quick in calling me a lie, because you don't know me that well anyway. And I really don't like for nobody to call me a lie. The slim drug addict hasn't raised his voice, but the message was there, loud and clear. Danny was a dangerous man, regardless of his size. Just how dangerous he was was well known by everybody except Buddy. Buddy was fairly new to the crowd. He had been with them long enough for them to have confidence in him. For the past three years, off and on, whenever Buddy came over for the summer to visit with El Dorado Red, he ended up running with the three men in the car. But Danny's friendship with Samson and Tubby dated back to their childhood days when they went to school together. Something seemed to warn Buddy because he fell silent, letting the matter drop. But he didn't fear Danny. To him, Danny was just a dumbass drug addict, one he would squash if the small man ever got in his way. Instead of arguing, he let his mind wander. He thought about his mother and brother and sisters back in the cold water flat in Chicago. Four women and one boy, 15 years old, crowded together in one filthy four-room apartment. The very thought of it made his jaw tighten in anger. All that room that no one used at El Dorado's house, yet his brother and sisters and mother had to make use of a rat-infested building. He was the oldest of the children, and the only child his mother bore for El Dorado Red. But he still held his father guilty of his mother's problem. His mother had run out on Red when Bunny was only a year old, choosing a pimp with a new Cadillac and going to Chicago. One Christmas five years later, she had called and given Red her address so that he could send some money for the child. After that, every month until the boy was grown, El Dorado Red had sent $100 to Chicago. If Buddy had asked, Red could have shown him money order stubs dating back 15 years. But Buddy never asked. He enjoyed nourishing his hatred.
The sight of the police cruiser put all of the men inside the car on alert. Where before the men had been slumped over and relaxed, now they were tense. Nobody glanced over at the police car as they pulled up beside it. You going to pass them? Tubby asked excitedly as they drew up next to the policeman. Samson didn't bother to answer. As the policeman glanced over at the passing car, Samson pretended to be laughing and made a gesture with his hand as he talked. It was all play acting for the benefit of the policeman. What are the bastards doing now, huh? Daddy asked from the back seat. Just be cool, man. Just be cool. The motherfucking pigs are still behind us, so just take it easy. I don't think the cocksuckers have made their cotton pick in mind whether or not to fuck with us. It was that same feeling that all black men had when they saw the police. Whether or not they had done anything didn't make a difference. They were black, and that was enough. It meant it was open season on them. At any time, they could be stopped and made to get out on the sidewalk with their hands in the air while the car was searched. This time, they were dirty. There were three guns in the car, and that meant a prison term for each man if the police decided to stop them and search the automobile. Man, if they look like they want to fuck with us, let's make a run for it. Maybe if you can gain a block on them, Danny stated in a matter-of-fact voice. We'll have time to throw these pistols out. Samson glanced in the mirror. They're sticking pretty damn close to our bumper. But if it looks like they've decided to fuck with us, I'll do what I can. Ain't no sense in laying down like a wet duck. Bust a cap in the motherfuckers, buddy said, his voice shaking. I don't want to go to no joint on no bullshit. If we blast at their ass, maybe we can get away. That's dead, baby. That's the coldest shit in town. The last thing in the world we want is a gunfight with the police. Samson looked sharply at Buddy. Are you out of your fucking mind? We ain't got no reason to hold court. Even if they stop us, everybody ain't got to fall. So they find some fucking guns in the car. They don't have to belong to everybody. I'll ride the beef out first before I'd let everybody fall on the same motherfucking charge. Buddy wiped the sweat off his brow. Okay, my man, he said with a smile. Just remember your words. If we get up tight, I hope you remember everything you just said. He hesitated for a second, then added, I can dig where you're coming from, though. It don't take everybody to do one bit. As Samson glanced at him sharply, Buddy continued, As far as I'm concerned, I don't know nothing about no guns. All of them are still in the glove compartment, ain't they? Danny laughed bitterly. You're one cold motherfucker, buddy. I wouldn't trust you in a shit house with a muzzle on. What the fuck do you mean by that? Buddy asked quickly. If you got something on your mind, man, come on out with it. Suddenly, Samson let out a breath of relief. The motherfuckers turned off. They must have got a call or something. I'd bet a $20 bill against a bucket of shit that they were going to fuck with us. It just goes to show you can't never tell. The men relaxed and joked back and forth the rest of the way. It was as if the police car had taken all the tension out of the robbery. Now they were ready. Samson parked the car a few doors down from the apartment building they were to enter. As they sat in the car waiting for the delivery man to arrive, Buddy scanned the street searching for that El Dorado that he knew so well. He let out a sigh of relief when he didn't see the car. If the other men knew that there was a chance of El Dorado Red showing up, they called the job off. Buddy prayed under his breath that this was one of the days that Red would be late showing up or wouldn't bother to stop by. The sudden appearance of a catering truck brought the men up in their seats. Is that the one that delivers the food? Danny asked from the back. More than likely that's it, Buddy replied. Like I said, they use a different delivery service just about every day. That way the drivers of the trucks don't get any ideas. You better get ready, Danny. Samson ordered as he reached over and opened up the glove compartment. He quickly removed the guns and passed them out. Buddy, you go with Tubby and bring back the driver. After that, you can sit the rest of the caper out just watching him. For a brief second, Buddy hesitated. He had hoped that he wouldn't have any reason to put a gun in his hand. That way, if something happened, he could always play on the fact that he hadn't used a gun. Now, if he followed Samson's order, he would be involved no matter what happened. The delivery man would never forget him. He was sure of that. His mind worked overtime trying to come up with an excuse, but he couldn't find one that was usable. It wasn't that he was scared, but Buddy just didn't want to get involved if it was possible for him not to. Well, my man, what the fuck are you going to do? Let the man get away, Samson asked sharply. For an answer, 
Buddy opened up the car door and got out, followed closely by Tubby. The two men approached the driver of the truck quickly. All right, mister. Don't breathe too hard if you know what's good for you, Buddy said as he stuck the gun into the ribs of the truck driver. The driver, a heavy set Negro, started to raise his hands. Just take it easy, kid, he said. I ain't got enough money on me to die for. You can have every fucking thing you see. This is just a job to me. I don't owe the company enough to lose my life over. Just keep your hands down then, Tubby ordered from the other side of the man. You don't give us no trouble, and we won't give you none. Just follow directions like you got good sense, my man. Tubby's voice was low, but there was no mistaking the determination behind the orders. We don't want your money, man. We just want to deliver those dinners for you, that's all. Buddy stated, then added, now, I want you to walk with us back to that car down the street. Just act normal, you know, as if we're old friends. Before Buddy finished instructing the man, Tubby had taken the frightened man's arm and led him down the sidewalk. As they approached the car, the door opened and Danny got out, dressed in a delivery man's outfit. The catering man took one glance at Danny, then quickly glanced around at the two men walking beside him. I mean, I know it ain't none of my business, but what's going on, he asked quietly. The less you know, the better off you'll be, Buddy stated as he shifted the two dinners he had picked up off the tailgate of the catering truck. He held the well-wrapped meals out to Danny. Here's your calling card, baby, he stated as Danny took the food from him. The men stood beside the car until Samson came around the car to the sidewalk. He opened up the car door and held it for the driver to get in. You just sit down and relax, mister. Ain't nobody gonna hurt you if you just follow orders. We ain't got no misunderstanding with you, so just be cool. We'll let you go in a few minutes if you just be cool. Buddy directed the man to the back seat, then climbed in with him after glancing up and down the street one more time, praying that his father hadn't pulled up. Buddy held the gun in his lap, not aiming it directly at the hostage. We're going to get along just fine, ain't we, brother? Buddy asked as his partners walked away from the car. The truck driver shook his head in agreement. You ain't got no worry about me, son. I ain't about to give you no problems. Buddy smiled and sat back. It looked as if his part of the job would end up being a snap. The man he had to watch didn't appear as if he would give him any trouble. His eyes surveying the street, he wondered again if his father would show up. He had lied to the other men about his father's whereabouts. He was well aware of El Dorado's habit of showing up at his numbers house during this time of the day. This concludes today's edition of Ralph Reads. I would like to thank you fellow queens and kings, my fellow royalty, for stopping by. You may connect with me on Twitter and Instagram as well as Periscope at RGMC2407. Drop me an email via RGMC2407 at gmail.com. If you would like to leave a small donation, please do so via paypal.me forward slash RGMC2407. Or the Cash App. My cash tag is RGMC2407. We are Ronin. You may find me on my very own channel, RGMC, Ralph Garcia, Master Ceremonies, as well as here at home on the United Ronin Networks. Fellow royalty, pick up a good book, read a good story, and set your good self free. I appreciate you and love you like cooked food. I will see you folks for the continuation of this story on Ralph Reads. Talk to you in a while.